I very appreciate the invitation of uh, Journal of Paleogeography and the International Society of uh, Paleogeography because I'm, I'm one of the founding members. So uh, I think uh, this uh, journal in this time is a very good opportunity to, public to publicate new ideas and to discuss some uh, new ideas and uh, of course uh, everyone uh, please send the paper to this to this journal because it's, uh, the editorial committee is, is very friendly so uh, next slide i think i have the, the power presenter so one moment so uh, during my speech i will try to speak uh, especially thinking in uh, our Chinese students. So uh, during today's speech, I'm going to move across these uh, two papers, these two papers published in Journal of Paleogeography, and uh, we are going to try to connect uh, two different topics which are not always considered uh, related in the present, uh, according to present paradigm. So we are going to talk about uh, deltas and at the same time we are linking deltas with uh, gravity flows or uh, sediment gravity flows. Uh, is, uh, with this link you can download these papers for free, as is the, <coughs> the norm in this journal of paleogeography. So, uh, for starting, I will uh, show you the main uh, objectives we are going to follow along this speech. First of all, uh, we are going to explore together the connection the in between gravity flows and deltas. We are going to introduce and discuss a relatively uh, simple classification of gravity flows focusing in the main mechanics that uh, support the sediment and how we can recognize different kind of gravity flows from the stratigraphic record. It's not always easy because in the field we, we used to have rocks and uh, from these rocks, from these rocks you, you want to try to get the processes and that is not always easy. Sometimes it's very difficult for a geologist to understand a process from a rock. And then we are going to discuss delta classifications, some delta classification, the kind of delta classification we have in the test books and some new classification taking into consideration this relationship between gravity flows and deltas. And uh, then we are going to go to the field together to see some uh, Feel examples of different kind of delta deposits from the Neuquén basin in Argentina and also Cuyo basin in Argentina and Yanchang formation in China. Uh, so we can get an idea of how different delta deposits can be and how the understanding of delta sedimentation can help us to get a better uh, understanding of uh, depositional systems and reservoirs. So, now I would like to, I no, do not go into make a very long PPT or PowerPoint presentation. My intention today is to make uh, some uh, explanations uh, online with some online drawing. So for that, I will uh, like to discuss with you some concept about gravity flows and some basic concept 
about delta, so we are going to move to the into the drawing board. So, follow me. So, for starting, uh, I would like to start discussing what is a gravity flow. A gravity flow basically is a flow that moves because of gravity. This is very important for moving uh, water flow, uh, rocks, and mixtures of sediment and water. It's very important for geologists. But the, mo the most important concept for understanding gravity flow was provided by a seminal paper of Middleton and Hampton. Oh, Simala. 1973. In this paper, this uh, geologist provide a very important definition because they uh, recognize two different kind of gravity flows. They speak about, uh, I will use this is bigger. They recognize fluid gravity flows and on the other side, sediment gravity flows. The main difference between these two kind of fluid and sediment gravity flow is where the gravity acts. For example, if you have just a fluid gravity flow, typical example is a river in which you have water moving down because of gravity so the gravity component is always providing the power to move the flow. And this flow, for example, water, moves because of gravity. And at the bottom, this flow can transport and can drag sediment. This is typical, most typical situation in clean rivers. So, water moves because of gravity and at the bottom and at the bottom you have this sediment transported as bedlot. I think uh, you have some uh, microphone open. Wang, can you turn off all of the microphones? Okay. So, uh, Hello, please turn off the microphone. Okay, uh, in contrast with fluid gravity flows, we have sediment gravity flows. In sediment gravity flows, it's very interesting because gravity acts on the sediment. So, if you have a slope here, gravity acts on the particles that are transported inside the flow. So, you have a component 
of the gravity and that provide the shear to move the sediment. So this is typical situation for mixtures of water and sediment. And the, one of the most important points of this kind of flows and the difference between these flows is that sediment gravity flows can be subaqueous, subaqueous and subaerial. And fluid gravity flows are almost all subaerial. Uh, this is very important for, tur for understanding turbidite, for example, and for understanding accumulation in shelf and, and deep water environment. But uh, as you are going to, we are going to discuss during this first introduction, most uh, models we have for deltas in according to the present paradigm are related to fluid gravity flows. So in these fluid gravity flows, you have, for example, a uh, delta system in which you have river, and this river carries the sediment into to the shore or for example in a in the sea or in a lake and this the water and sediment carried by the river hmm, provide accumulate the sediment here because of this fluid gravity flow. The fluid gravity flow provides sediments and water to the basin. And uh, more interesting, sediment gravity flows are not work in that way. So what's important for sediment gravity flow? According to this paper of Middleton and Hampton, for understanding sediment gravity flows, we have to take into consideration the different kind of mechanisms that support the sediment. For example, for sediment gravity flows, the main mechanics that support the sediments are matrix cohesion. This is the sediment is supported because of a muddy matrix here. You have also water escape, water trying to escape, I will explain better later on. This is water escape grain-to-grain -grain interaction or dispersive pressure this is because of the collision of different grain particles that provide some support and finally turbulence that help in support the sediments inside the flow. So according to this different support mechanics, we can make a classification of sediment gravity flows. Hello? Your microphone. Hmm? I think the administrator can turn off all uh, microphone. No? Okay. We, c we cannot turn off the microphone from here. Okay. So uh, now it's, it's very important uh, for these ca different categories of sediment support mechanisms because they different categories, these different categories define the different kind of flows you have. For example, if you have here 
100% of matrix cohesion so you will have a cohesive debris flow because cohesive debris flow is dominated by matrix cohesion we are going to see a very beautiful example of present uh, cohesive debris flows and how we can recognize those flows in the field so if you decrease the matrix cohesion this happen because the flow get it start to incorporate water and as the flow start incorporate water the flows will transform into a fluid this is a plastic basically and at the same time you start to incorporate water and you change the sediment support mechanics so in this cohesive debris flow the main important sediment support mechanics is matrix cohesion here then you change you start to incorporate this is water scape and dispersive pressure or grain to grain interaction and then dispersive pressure and grain to grain interaction decrease until zero at this point start to have to became more important turbulence so when turbulence becomes the dominant process you go into a fully turbulent flow so this will define the main categories of gravity flows I will put some colors here so you have cohesive debris flow here with sediment supported by matrix cohesion then you have water scape and grain to grain interaction and finally when you incorporate more water the main support mechanism will be turbulence so according to this these different fields you have here cohesive debris flow hyper concentrated flows concentrated flows and sediment laden turbulent flows so these different categories of flows are related to different sediment support mechanism for example cohesive debris flows is plastic then from here you go into a fluid fluid or Newtonian flow so you change from plastic into fluid and this is a rheological transformation of course along these changes you are going to have a lot of changes from you start to have laminar <coughs> condition then a turbulent condition so you have some uh, flow transformation and you have also hydraulic jump because you go also from inertia into uh, gravity dominated flows uh, it's, it's quite interesting how this kind of flows also change in concentration and change in the amount of sediment you have so the result will be very different if you enter this kind of flows into um, 
a basin. So if you have, again, if you have here a situation in which you have a river, a river with a fluid gravity flow here, just moving water and sediments in the bottom. Could you, could you turn off the microphone, please? Okay, uh, this river transports sediment as bed lot. This is a common situation for the deltas as we can find in the, our textbook. So sediment, sandstones transported as bed lot will be accumulated in the delta front here and the plant remains a refined grain material will form a plume from which you are going to accumulate the pro delta. So this is changes between sandy deposit at the delta from and shales in the pro delta. So uh, situation of marine litter. Okay, this happened when you have fluid gravity flow as a source of sediment and water. But if you have here, in contrast, a sediment gravity flow, the situation can absolutely change because the density of this sediment gravity flow can be much more higher. So is your river discharge here a mixture of water and sediment with a relatively high density, your delta is not going to be here. Your delta can transform in a all kind of deposit of a series of deposits that will be accumulated along the basin. Also, you can have flows and deposits in the inner part of the basin. For example, as uh, if you contrast the kind of deposit, again, in between Littoral deltas, littoral deltas deposits are here, but we, if we change the source between fluid gravity flows into sediment gravity flows, your deltas will be much more extended, so you can have channels and also lobes or extra basinal turbidites supply by this kind of sediment gravity flows. So sediment gravity flows are very important for delta sedimentation because change absolutely our understanding about delta deposits. Delta deposits, when we take in consideration sediment gravity flows, delta deposits are not always uh, coastal 
element. Delta deposit is a depositional feature that can extend very far from the coast. So uh, we are going now to go back to see some classification of uh, deltas and gravity flows and then after that we are going to visit some field localities. So uh, we are going to see how this sediment gravity flow interacts with the basin providing some uh, new uh, vision of delta sedimentation. Okay, let's go back into the... I will keep in here. So, this is... Uh, okay, I will... I will I will move. Just to review some of the delta classification we have in the in our papers, as you can see in most papers, deltas are considered littoral or coastal system. Just also in uh, in in the sea and also on lakes. It's very interesting because these deltas were classified according to the shape according and also according to geomorphology instead of the stratigraphic importance. So it, this is a classification of coastal system you can find in our textbooks and as you can see deltas are putting together with the barriers, with the estuaries with the tidal flats, with any different kind of element you have in the coastal areas. But uh, I think this is a very short and narrow view of deltas. I will go in back to the drawing board one moment just to discuss with you a very <coughs> common classification we found in the textbook, which is the classification of Galloway, in which we take into consideration the main diffusion processes in between fluvial dominated, wave dominated, and tide dominated delta. So, as you can see here, the main important for the classification, this classification of deltas is <coughs> the kind of uh, reworking or diffusion process you have uh, in the coastal system. This is the Callaway uh, in 1955. So according to this classification you have this uh, bed food deltas like the Mississippi deltas, you have this lobate deltas, and you have this tidal deltas with the, these tidal bars, or you have these deltas with barriers and strand planes related to wave activity. So, according to the main diffusion process, you have these geomorphological features in delta. But I think this classification just apply for uh, some kind of deltas which are related to fluid gravity flows. Not this classification dot don't apply for deltas related to sediment gravity flows. So going back into this. Uh, into the presentation. So, we can see here some definition about deltas. Uh, as you can see, this definition, for example, consider deltas as discrete 
shoreline protuberance form where rivers enter the ocean. So this definition is geomorphological. Take into consideration especially the position of deltas very close to the river mouth. But uh, we have another definition that uh, think uh, deltas as depositional elements. For example, the main point of the classification of Moore and Askit here is the sediment mass deposit in a body of water by a river. So if you have a sediment accumulated directly by a river, those sediments will belong to a delta not only those sediments located at the coast. More, very interesting if we also <coughs> take into consideration the classification of baits. Baits proposed this classification 70 years ago. It's very old. But uh, according to Bates, not all deltas are literal. You have uh, for example, uh, marine littoral delta, when you have this uh, fluid gravity flows, the density of the incoming flow is lower, so the sediments are going to be accumulated in the coastal areas in the delta from, so because the density is lower, we call this kind of delta marine littoral deltas related to hypopignal flows. In this situation, the density of the river water is similar to the density of the water on the reservoir. So this is a typical situation of Gilbert deltas or homopignal flows. And finally, according to Bates, this is a very interesting situation in which <coughs> the density of the incoming flow for example, if you have a cohesive uh, debris flow, a concentrated flow, hyperconcentrated flow, or sediment-laden turbulent flow, you have a flow, a sediment gravity flows with a density which is higher than the density of the water in the reservoir, you, build, you will build a submarine or subaqueous deltas related to a uh, hyperpignal flow. This is the reason why I think uh, sediment gravity flows are very important for deltas and sediment gra and the interaction and sediment gravity flows and deltas can explain a lot, a lot of deposits we have in our basins. A lot of deposits which we cannot explain using the conventional classification of the positional environment. So a lot of delta deposits, my, in my opinion, are inside the basin and we are not, we are not classified accordingly up to the present. So I think we have to start uh, studying again the rocks or the fossil system according to a new paradigm. So if you go back into main definition of gravity flows and sediment gravity flows, this was the classification you can find in the paper uh, of the uh, Journal of Paleogeography. As you can see here, you have different fields. I'm going again here to explain better. <coughs> so, you have here uh, different kind of flows, cohesive debris flows, hyperconcentrated flows, concentrated flows, and sediment-laden turbulent flow. I prefer to use sediment-laden turbulent flow instead of uh, tur low density turbidite because turbidite means turbid not turbulent in the definition so a uh, turbidity current is basically a turbid flow 
So to avoid that confusion, I prefer to use sediment laden turbulent flow. In many classifications, you will find that people call this concentrated flow as high density turbidites and low density turbidite. But I prefer to use concentrated flows and sediment laden turbulent flow. As you can see here, you have different sediment concentration and sediment concentration decrease as you go, for example, from a plastic dominated by matrix cohesion into laminar. So how this transition happen? This is because when we move a cohesive debris flow, in a cohesive debris flow you have a rigid plug. Rigid plug. Rigid plug means that this part of the cohesive debris flow, the clasp cannot move and interact together. All moves are a single mass of sediment. So this is not laminar nor turbulent. It's just a plastic. And this plastic interacts with the bottom with this overpressure basal level. This is its overpressure level at the base. So when you move this rigid plug here, this plastic, into the basin, water is going to get in. If you have water, water is going to get in here. And water will start to make a dilution of these cohesive debris flows and you are going to start with the waterscape mm? and waterscape will transform this cohesive debris flow when you incorporate more water and you transform this flow into a laminar flow of course you are not going to be able to support the bigger clust supported by matrix but this going to transform into a laminar flow very fast moving flow dominated by water scape so you are going from cohesive debris flow into a hyper concentrated flow so you go from plastic here into newtonian or fluid flow so you increase at this when you have this change you are going to increase the flow velocity if you see a uh, cohesive debris flow you are going to see that cohesive debris flows moves very slowly but uh, when you incorporate water and you have this rheological transformation you go from a plastic into a laminar flow so you are going to increase velocity here in the bottom you have low flow velocity flow velocity increase due to this rheological transformation and you go into a fluid newtonian flow this newtonian flow at the beginning is laminar but uh, then when matrix cohesion decrease and you start to have turbulence here you have a transformation between a laminar and turbulent flow so this is a flow transformation but of course all these kind of flows are this hyper concentrated and concentrated flow are super critical dominantial by inertia but uh, when you go at this point you transform this supercritical into subcritical flow you will decrease again the velocity so this is inertia dominated this is gravity dominated so you will have this turbulent and subcritical flow 
In some situations, also some turbulent flow can accelerate and go supercritical again. But in the basic flow transformation, you go from you change from plastic into fluid and laminar turbulent subcritical subcritical and also here you can see how the concentration of sediment decrease until this bagnol limit of 9% which is the threshold for turbulence pure turbulence so i think uh, uh, okay one more slide and then we go into a break just to see well we are going to see this after the break some examples of cohesive debris flows in natural environment and also on the field so we are going to have here a 15 minutes of break and after that we are going to continue with this topic of about the uh, sediment gravity flows so so, uh, thank you for still being here. Uh, we are going to continue now with uh, some examples of cohesive debris flow. As we know, cohesive debris flows are plastic flows with a high concentration of sediment. Sediments are supported because of matrix cohesion. This make these flows uh, these flows is can transport any kind of size of sediment so the typical characteristic is usually the deposit you are not going to have erosional surfaces at the bottom and uh, basically the deposit will be supported by uh, mud usually so let's see some this is a video in which you can see a uh, cohesive debris flow, you can see very big clasps transported in the flow, but one of the main characteristics is if you decrease the flow, the flow freezing. Uh, the flow is freezing by uh, cohesive freezing. This, is, this means that the internal cohesion is so high, so if you decrease the shear, the flow absolutely absolutely freezes and preserve the original packing of the flow so it's not it is not possible to reaccommodate the clust inside a cohesive debris flow so uh, when you stop the flow the flow the clust will remain in the original position also in vertical position so it's uh, very interesting, it's a very diagnostic criteria for the recognition of cohesive debris flow, how this flow, when this flow stop. So let's go now to the field and uh, to see some examples from the Naquin Basin. For this we are going to use our virtual platform. This is a or immersive platform in which we can access to different basins from Argentina and also in the world and we can visit uh, outcrops from, uh, at the s from very fast from Argentina, from uh, China, from everywhere from the world uh, with a single click. Now we are going to land into the Neuken Basin Neuken Basin uh, became famous in recent time because of the Baca Muerta uh, formation, Baca Muerta Shale. So uh, this is the geology of the Neuken Basin. The Neuken Basin is located close to the Andean foothill. Uh, it's a basin that's, that start with the reef and then you go into uh, at the end in a foreland basin but uh, this basin is very important for the oil industry in the Neuken basin so we are going to see a lot of examples of outcrops uh, in this basin now we are going to land in the central part of the basin we have here many localities and we are going to see some deposit recent deposits 
here in uh, in uh, near a river uh, bank near a river valley so at this time we are going to learn uh, to see some examples of cohesive debris flow very nice examples of cohesive debris flows at the size of at the uh, you can open here Mariano in the top so you can guide yourself across the the points so then go into the okay this is a view of uh, this deposit we are going to focus in and as you can see uh, the class this big class are floating in inside this uh, matrix mud rich uh, sediment so uh, this is not the point you have the hmm? 1.2 okay so if we make if we go close to this uh, outcrop so you make zoom here you zoom in you will see uh, I will go here so we can see it better and uh, if you click in this 3d model we can see here uh, okay this is a 3d model of this cohesive debris flow and you can zoom in here you can see that clust are in different position also clust are in vertical position mm. and uh, the matrix is muddy this muddy matrix allow to sustain any kind of deposits like this big uh, clust of basalt here and uh, also you cannot see internally any sedimentary structure this is a typical characteristic of this uh, kind of uh, deposit this kind of uh, of uh, accumulation so if you can move into the next uh, or you yeah this is this is another point here as the flow start to incorporate some uh, more water you start to have some grading here as you can see the sediments are quartz grained in the lower part and decrease the grain size toward the top uh, moving to this position you can see also some other 3d models okay this is another 3d view and we can see here look at this class this class is not horizontal this means that the flow the flow was cohesive because the normal position of a class the more stable position is this but if you have a class in this position means that the class is not is not possible for this class to rotate and to achieve this more stable position so this is the reason why this class is vertical because in along all this hmm, all this here is a muddy matrix hmm. so you have mud here this muddy matrix provide the cohesion for sustain any kind of different size of sediments or deposits okay we can go back and see the other 3d model this one okay 
This is a big clust and uh, very interesting. As you can see, you can, with the cohesion, matrix cohesion, you can sustain any kind, any size of sediment from mud to very big, to boulders, to very big clusters. And at the bottom, as you can see here, you have this overpressure level that is this one. This overpressure level is very important because allow this plastic, this rigid plug to move. So the overpressure level is like uh, a carpet that allow this plug, this uh, cohesive debris flow to move and also is the key for incorporating water and start the dilution, dilution of this cohesive debris flow. Okay. Uh, from here we are going to move to yeah this is another the last one this is a very big cluster here and you can see in more detail with this 3d model this is a very big cluster that is supported by a matrix cohesion also mm. In the lower part, in this part, you can see this the overpressure. This is the overpressure carpet in this area. So I will can mark here. From here up to this is the overpressure carpet. So the rigid plug moves in between this level and this one so this at this level start some kind of laminar flow that will increase the speed and also allow the flow to incorporate water if you are in a subaqueous environment so uh, okay from here we are going to fly into ¿Qué es la línea celeste esta? Ok. From here we are going to fly to another place in the Neuke Basin to see to the north area of the basin. So, this is a north sector of Neuke Basin. And we are going to visit uh, this uh, Chosmalal area. And from here you can open the menu here on top and then go directly. These are all these you can see here are different localities with a lot of tops with outcrops to visit. So you can rotate into this position. We are going to see a mass transport complex that he outcrops in this area. So Okay. This is uh if you rotate a little the outcrop, you can see that the dip and strike on the bottom and top is the same. So all this deposit you have here is part of a mass transport complex in deep water environment. You can see a lot of big clust here probably uh, generated by a gravity collapse of uh, part of a slope. Internally, you can see pieces of uh, lobes of pieces of turbidites. And also in this 3D model, this is a 3D model of the outcrop. <coughs> You can clearly see the base and the top of this uh, mass transport complex deposits with a lot of clasts inside. All these deposits, the class are supported or uh, is are supported by matrix cohesion. So this deposit of a cohesive debris 
flow. So some more photograph. You can see some folded. Uh, this is uh, very very important for understanding the how in in deep water how a uh, cohesive debris flow start. For example, if you have a slope mm, and in this slope you have some gravity instability usually you start having some kind of normal folds here it's like a fold thrust belt in which you have pieces of folded rock that these folds start to move and this sediment moves basingward and consequently the original deposit is very common to have pieces of folded some reman some remains of the original blocks that were generated during the collapse of this slope so this is a mass strampor complex with these folded pieces of rock. Basically, this kind of mass transport complex are part, are cohesive debris flow. Of course, if you incorporate water here, you are going, you can have hyper concentrated flows concentrated flows and finally sediment laden turbulent flows in of but these are a typical case of intrabational turbidity so going back so this is a folded example sample of a folded bed mm many different folded beds in in between this outcrop so okay this is another view i think i think here we go into again okay let's go let's bar go back into the presentation okay and now uh, the situation changed as we discussed early cohesive debris flows can incorporate water and became laminar so this make uh, this uh, possible for this flow to have a rheological transformation in between a plastic and a fluid flow and as a consequence the flow is going to accelerate and will become a very fast moving and very dangerous flows. This kind of hyper concentrated flows can travel more than 200 kilometers an hour. So very fast, very high density, so very dangerous flows. So we are going to see uh, some example of it's a video. You can click on the video uh, that uh, um, hyper concentrated flow happened in Switzerland, and uh, it's uh, very nice to see uh, how fast these flows can move and how dangerous these flows can be. Seen since as you can see here the sediment concentration is between 40 and 70 percent and the density can be uh, between 1000 and uh, 1800 kilograms for cubic meters so these flows are very fast are more dangerous than cohesive debris flows because these flows are inertia dominated flows and uh, usually can transfer a lot of sediment very fast in a lot in a short span of time 
So, um, okay. Guys, you can see the amount of sediment this kind of flows can, can transfer. So, going into a more, uh, if you incorporate water, you go into concentrated flows. In concentrated flow, you start to have turbulence. And again, these are supercritical flows. Uh, this is a video also of an example of supercritical flows, concentrated flows. Uh, this kind, this in this example, the discharge, the concentration was about s near 700 kilograms for cubic meter. So this is a concentration in which you have interaction of sediment, grain to grain interaction, and also uh, this kind of uh, waterscape. Uh, let's go into the field now to see some deposit of concentrated flows. So we had to go back. to the central part of the basin. Okay. Basically, how we can recognize concentrated flows in the deposit of concentrated flow. In concentrated flows, you have a flow and high inertia or granular flow, a high inertia dominated flow that need some slope to travel. And inside the flow, you have large-scale turbulence and grain-to-grain -grain interaction. So, in this kind of flows, the density increase toward the bottom. So, it's very common to have in this flow two kind of sedimentary structures. On one side, you have the flow, you have a flow in which this kind of concentrated flow continuously incorporate water from below. This make these flows continually affected by waterscape. So it's very common to have in this flow sedimentary structures like dish. Very common in turbidite. And also this segregation, vertical segregation, on the in the concentration results in the accumulation of this coarsening upward traction carpets. So typically these traction carpets you will see this coarsening upward intervals that result from the segregation of the quartzite fraction here and due to grain to grain interaction you have this lower part in which you have traction carpets so traction carpets and massive sandstone with dish structures are typical features that allow the recognition of deposits related to these concentrate flows. So we are going to see some example of traction carpets here in some volcanic plastic deposits near this uh, valley. So you can zoom in before going to the... Okay, you can see here some uh, lamination, very diffuse, diffuse lamination here. Mm -hmm. 
but if you look into in detail this like in the photograph uh, you can see this kind of uh, very uh, strange uh, lamination with intervals with more quartz grain material in some places you can see some reverse grading like here related to this grain to grain interaction and as you can see the carpets are of different thickness so you can see this in the photograph and also in the 3d model so beautiful example of traction carpets mm, this is not planar lamination these are traction carpets related to this grain to grain interaction at the base of a, a concentrated flow okay you have another example <coughs> okay this is in the same in the similar outcrop you have a lot of examples here in some situation you can have this uh, traction carpet associated in some places with some cross bedding so this is part of the same traction carpets related to this grain to grain interaction okay I think we will have okay is it el punto was cinco uh -huh. okay let's go back to the powerpoint <coughs> So uh, now we are going to fly to another location in the Jurassic of the Neuken Basin. So we are going to land here, going back and flying to the southern area of the basin. in the railway area okay no this one okay in this area we are going to visit this number three here Cambias la cámara acá. No, no es este. Quita el precuyar. El IJ2 acá. Okay. Uh, we are going to visit this locality in which you have these uh, thick, relatively thick beds of quartz grain sandstones. In these uh, sandstones, uh, these sandstones are massive and you see the photograph here. You can see the grain size is very is made of quartz grain sandstones no sedimentary structure here but in some situation you can see uh, this disturbation in some diffuse lamination with these dish structures these structures as you can see here dish is produced by this water scape water try to escape is water is incorporated from below here 
the, from the base of the flow and the water try to escape and at the same time this produce this kind of uh, disturbation in the stratification this is typical dish structures Okay, you can see some more examples. Mm -hmm. Okay, this associated with uh, shales in the deep water environment. This is part of the Jurassic, the lower Jurassic of the Neuken Basin. <coughs> okay, in this photograph you can see the grain size is very coarse grained. This is related to the uh, kind of flow you have. This is inertia dominated flow. Class supported very coarse sandstones uh, in which the class are supported by grain to grain interaction. So, uh, you have another? Hmm? Okay, here are some more examples in this photograph. With internal variation here, but always with these quartz grain deposits. Hmm? Quartz grain sandstones. Okay, let's go back to the presentation so now we are going to move into sediment laden turbulent flows these are uh, flows in which the sediment concentration is lower lower than 9% in volume so this is a fully turbulent so fully turbulent flow means that the grains inside the turbulent flow cannot interact with another so we, we don't have any collision in between the grain the grain moves freely inside the flow so fully turbulent flow uh, fluid flow and velocity decrease when here when you have this transition between supercritical and subcritical so you have here an hydraulic jump so uh, in this kind of uh, flows or sediment laden turbulent flows are very common in subaqueous environment and perhaps is one of the most important uh, sub most important element in this kind of uh, subaqueous deltas because these flows can transfer a lot of uh, material from the continent and also a lot of wood and uh, plant remains we commonly found in our deposits so sediments in this kind of flows are transported as suspended load and bed load. Of course, suspended load are part of uh, a very important because suspended load can transfer the shear into the bottom and allow the transfer of gravels. So we have many different typical sedimentary structures we accumulate from this sediment laden turbulent flow. The most typical sedimentary structures are this uh, interaction between bed lot and suspended lot that allow the accumulation of these floating pebbles we are going to discuss in more detail in the next slide. Then you have some cross bedding, these asymptotic dunes. You have massive sandstones, very important because this all these structures are related to different kind of traction plus uh, fallout 
fall out from the sediment in suspension. So according to the rate of fallout, you can have massive sandstones laminated or claiming ripples. So we are going to see how this kind of um, deposit related to bed lot and suspended lot form. Bed lot and suspended lot can act together. Let's go a little into the <coughs> drawing board. So typically in this sediment laden turbulent flow you have a mixture of water and sediment. So you have here, here sediment in suspension. This sediment in suspension is part of the suspended load. And this suspended load provides some shear at the bottom. And these shears allow the transfer of clust. This can be lithic clust or can be also clay clust. These are clust part of this bed lot. But suspended lot sometimes collapse and the collapse of the suspended load make this flow bottom to rise. So as the flow bottom is rising, the clust in some situation can be trapped inside the suspended load. So the typical deposit, you will have sandstones or massive sandstone with levels of clust that appears floating inside the sandstone. For example, for uh, some other geologists, for example, Professor Shamugan called this sandy debris flow. But sandy debris flow is a kind of cohesive flow. This is not cohesive flow. This is a fluid flow. For me, this is not a sandy debris flow. This is because as the result of suspended load plus bed load. Suspended load and bed load acting together in a kind of uh, sediment laden turbulent flow. So let's see now some examples about how suspended load and bed load accumulate together. So this happened, this is a typical deposit of an interaction between suspended load. This sandstone here is well sorted. This is because it was part of the suspended load. And at the same time you have bed load. As you can see, bed load is imbricated here. Imbrication is because the class is moving and gets some more stable position. A stable position means that if the flow is going in this direction and the class, a class is rotating, the more stable position for a flow going this way is this one. So if you see class in this position means that the flow was in that direction and also also suggests that the flow was able to rotate. So it's not a cohesive flow. It's a flow in which class rotate and were transported by the shear provided by the suspended load. So you have this turbulent flow here that provide the shear and at the same time you have the collapse of suspended load and bed load in the at the bottom. So let's see the next uh, in the next slide you will see a video here in which 
we see this uh, a turbulent suspension and this turbulent suspension is going to collapse and at the same time you are going to have bed load so this is suspended load as you can see suspended load is accumulating sediment here but the bottom of the flow is rising and the position is gradual this means that the accumulation continues as you continue to supply sediment you can see that the class transported as bed lot are floating here floating inside a matrix of sand so very important for understanding how this kind of deposits accumulate this is because these flows can be sustained for a lot of time uh, it's, it's very interesting because it's, this is just a small flume experiment but in nature of course we can have flows that can be sustained not just for some uh, seconds like this one you can sustain this flow for days or even weeks so the thickness the final thickness of the deposits is not going to depend on the thickness of the overpassing flow but on the time in which you can sustain the flow so you can sustain the flow for many days or weeks the thickness of the sediments can be very high so this is a very important this is very important for the deposition of deltas how we can recognize this kind of deposits bed lot dominated deposits basically with uh, this clust which are aligned inside massive sandstone mm. here you have an association of this okay this is these are clust here floating clust inside massive sandstone these are deposit of turbidites of different uh, uh, these also are turbidites from the offshore brazil from argentina and many other examples it's, this is in the austral basin deep water deposits in the austral basin in the southern part of argentina and uh, many other examples from venezuela pampatar ashimov formation in russia and also Mayaro formation in Trinidad so very very common uh, okay let's go now to the Opa. let's go to the field now to see some example in the Neuquén Basin in the Sierra de la Vaca Muerta area, we go into the central part of the basin. Okay, central part. This is Sierra de la Vaca Muerta area. And then from here, you can open the menu on top and to select the localities we want to visit. Okay, we are going to see some examples here from uh, um, this is an alluvial farm at the base of the Jurassic Tordillo formation and here I would like to show you these 3D models here in which you can see the interaction of suspended load and bed load typically uh, you can see that the matrix here is sandy and inside the clust here you have imbrication it's very clear the imbrication the clust imbrication suggesting a flow going this way 
but at the same time you have these flow fluctuations internally this is part of the collapse of the suspended load these sandstones here and bed load transported by shear at the bottom of the suspended load okay then the next locality we are going to move a, a little faster okay this is another 3d model here with some more example of this interaction between suspended load and bed load so sandstones here the more fine grain sandstone here are relay are part of the suspended load and this class these are limestone class eroding from uh, a coeval anticline the erosion of uh, limestone on an anticline and then you have this uh, imbrication class imbrication suggesting that these class were transported as bed load imbrication class imbrication is a diagnostic feature of bed load okay we are going to see the last examples then you are going to the break so for the last example we we had to go back here to the central part we go in here into Warinchinke, i think you can open the menu on top and check this okay this is Warren Chenke 3 and we go into 3.2 and just to see some of these 3D models some beautiful example of the interaction between suspended load and bed load o of course you can have this process uh, in a turbidite in deep water or you can have this in a fluvial also during a fluvial flood in a fluvial valley in some situation when you when the river is full of sediment you can accumulate also this kind of interaction between suspended load and bed load as you can see gravels are aligned here following these patterns so uh, we are going to continue with uh, some uh, other very important deposits in deltas associated with gravity flows is sometimes massive sandstones are poorly understood so i would like to discuss with you the origin of massive sandstone massive sandstone is very very common in every basin and perhaps is the most common deposit of deltas of subaqueous deltas this is because massive sandstones form because of the collapse of the suspended load when a sediment laden turbulent flow charged with the sun start to decrease velocity this flow is losing flow uh, capacity so the flow capacity is decreasing very fast and the flow collapse and this will create at the bottom a flow transformation between a turbulent flow on top and a laminar flow in below since this flow is laminar is not possible to create here any sedimentary uh, structure so this happen when the rate of fallout of the sediment is higher is very high so according to some experiment the rate of fallout should be higher than 2.64 centimeters a minute so at this rate of fallout you will create this laminar flow interval in the lower part that prevents the generation of sedimentary structure 
one typical sedimentary structure, one diagnostic sedimentary structure that allow the recognition of these laminar flow conditions is flame structure. Let's go into the, the drawing board. If you have a bottom here of shale, in a soapy state so this is this is shale unconsolidated shale and above you have here a sediment laden turbulent flow a flow with a lot of sand in suspension so this in this flow, when this flow decreases velocity, the sandstone start to accumulate at the bottom. So concentration, flow concentration, is increasing toward the bottom. So as, the conse as a consequence, you start to have here a laminar flow at the bottom and turbulent flow on top okay this is turbulent this is lower laminar flow the accumulation of this laminar flow here produce some disturbation in the shale the unconsolidated shales in below so I will put this different color for the laminar and this color for turbulent so this laminar flow here create different velocity so this make the shale to deform and to form these typical flames made of shales so these flames is because the flow here is laminar and is moving below this turbulent part of this flow so this is the laminar part of the flow and on top turbulent part and at the bottom you have this flame structures flame structures typical of at the bottom of massive sandstones so we are going to see now um, in the next slide it's a very interesting video uh, you can find in internet in which we are going to see here a flume experiment uh, in which uh, uh, we um, start with the turbulent flow with the composition is mainly the composition is mainly of uh, fine grain sandstones, fine grain sand, and as this turbulent flow uh, gradually uh, decreases the velocity. So here you can see the composition is mainly of fine grain sandstone. So at uh, the first time you are going to see the video in real time and I will mark here the different element you have the head and this is the turbulent part of the flow and at the bottom you start to see this laminar flow in here so this is the boundary this is the flow transformation between it's a gravity transformation between a turbulent flow this is a low velocity so all this is turbulent but when the sediment start to concentrate in the lower part you are going to see a boundary here 
This boundary is a boundary between turbulent flow on the top, this is a turbulent part of the flow, and in the lower part you have the laminar part of the flow. As you can see, the sediment, the velocity is decreasing as you go to the bottom. So if you have mud here, a mud intrusion, your mud intrusion will be deflected forming this flame here. You are going to have a flame here like this because of the decreasing velocity at the bottom due to this mud injection. So, uh, very, very interesting video. In the next, the, okay, this is a cartoon in which uh, you can see how is the interaction between this turbulent flow, laminar flow on the bottom, gradual accumulation, and the intrusion of this mud, and the deflection of the crest of the mud due to the laminar flow uh, you have at the bottom of this sediment laid in turbulent flow. So, finally, you, we can understand how massive sand, sandstone form. It's not possible to create massive sandstone with a fluid gravity flow. With fluid gravity flow, you cannot have massive if you have massive sandstones, means you are dealing with sediment gravity flows. Mm? It's not possible to accumulate massive sandstone by fluid gravity flows. You need sediment in suspension. You need to have here suspended load. Suspended load and suspended load, the fallout, fallout of suspended load at the rate higher than 2.64 centimeters minute. Mm? This is a high rate of fallout of sediment that helps in create massive sandstone. So let's go now to the field and see some examples of massive sandstones. So here we go in the center part of the basin, Sierra de Vaca Muerta, there, central part, then Sierra de la Vaca Muerta, in the southern area of Sierra de la Vaca Muerta, we have the Arroyo Cobunco section. Yes, number five. And along this succession, you have a very good exposure of the Jurassic. This is all the middle Jurassic of the Neuquén Basin, Los Molles and Laja Formation, and on top you have some... Uh, uh, I will go into the... Okay. Can you change the camera here? Okay. This is the Middle Jurassic, Los Molles, Lajas Formation. There you have some limestone here from the Tabano Formation. And we are going here to land into this, the Lotera Formation and this at this position here. So at this position or the <coughs> or the previous one sorry this one okay and in this uh, these are marine deposits and uh, typically you will see here very well sorted sandstones tabular bodies and in the middle see, you ca we can see some photograph here sandstone 
that look massive composed of fine grain sandstone very fine grain sandstone mm. in the next in the 3d models perhaps we can see more clearly how these massive sandstones looks like uh, these uh, sandstones as we are going to discuss later is like uh, these sandstones are like the TA of Boma. You remember in the Boma, typical Boma sequence, you have massive sandstone here or TA, then you have laminated sandstones or TB, then sandstones with ripples. or TC and then some silt and mud T, D and E. So this part is massive sandstone. This massive sandstone in some is very typical in many delta succession to have these massive sandstones without ripples on top. I will go into discuss later on what is the explanation of this kind of massive sandstone. This is massive sandstone without ripples on top. This is because the origin of this deposit of these sandstones are not related to intrabasinal processes but are related to um, to uh, hyperpignal flow. So the water in the flow, the fresh water in the flow induce the flow to or make forces the flow to buoy before getting the velocity of forming ripples. So you just have massive sandstorms here. So let's go back as these are the typical beds as you can see you have many amalgamated bed with massive sandstone without ripples you can close it's also another this one another 3d model okay yeah so similar mm, more regional view. Okay, uh, let's go back into the presentation now. Uh, I would like to discuss now the relationship, the linking between gravity flows and delta, putting all together these two concepts we were discussing during the previous chapters. It's very important now to take into consideration because according to the classical uh, paper of Mulder and Saibisky, the 1995, Mulder and Saibisky, they propose that, for example, if you have marine setting and you have a river entering the basin, the concentration of the river discharge should be higher than 35, 45 kilograms cubic meter to allow this flow to be more dense than marine waters. So the, in this condition, the flow can plunge and can make a hyperpignal flow. So, but this threshold is not too high. If we now take the sediment concentration of these different kind of flows, you can see that 
all these flows are much more higher than the 35 kilograms we need. For example, sediment laden turbulent flow can be up to more than 200 kilograms of sediment for cubic meter. So this is much more the concentration we need in a river to go hyperpignal. Of course, you are going to have a lot of different kind of deposit associated to this sediment laden turbulent flow. Now, if we go and we put it together, this is also available in a paper we have in the journal of um, paleogeography. You can download for free from journal of paleogeography. And in this uh, model, on in this uh, diagram, we put in together the flow concentration. Here you have the different kind of uh, categories. You have sediment laden turbulent flows, pure turbulent flows, concentrated flow, hyperconcentrated flow, and coercive debris flows. All these flows you have the density of the flow, total density or bulk density, then you have the concentration of sediment in kilogram for cubic meter. As you can see, these are sediment free rivers or clean rivers. Of course, this is in logarithmic scale, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. It's logarithmic scale. Then you have this clean river, then you have dirty rivers. Dirty in which the sediment concentration is quite high. And on the other side, you have the density of the water in the basin. So you go from shallow to fresh water, from fresh water lakes here, brackish basin, you can be, can be, of course, lakes can, can be brackish or can be saline, Marine water usually can be also in, in continental seas, can be a little bit brackish or can be, uh, for example, this is the normal salinity in between 30 and 40 uh, grain for uh, uh, cubic meter. And of course, this is the older range of salinity also in logarithmic scale. And also in below you have the total density. So if you compare the density of the water and the density of the flow, you are going to have this line here, which is the homopignal threshold. Means that along this line, the density of the river discharge and the density of the water in the reservoir is the same. So according to this, this contrast of density between gravity flows and water in the basin, you can, you, we can define different kind of deltas. Uh, three deltas in the hypopignal field, one delta in the homopignal field, and three kind of deltas in the hyperpignal field. Of course, very important for the oil industry also are also for our understanding of delta deposition are these subaqueous deltas. Hyperpignal literal deltas, which form very beautiful parasequences we are going to discuss later on. This is a poorly known kind of deltas. Subaqueous deltas, hyperpignal subaqueous deltas, very common in lakes and very common in also in marine setting. A lot of deposits in many basins are related to this kind of deltas. And also this hyperpignal fan deltas, but hyperpignal fan deltas are much more limited because for to form this kind of delta, you need to have this 
high inertial dominated flows and which are much more common in high gradient setting. So very important to understand this kind of flows and the main difference between this hyperpignal littoral deltas and hyperpignal subaqueous delta. As you can see, the main difference is the density contrast. If the density contrast is not too high, for example, this is the threshold, 35, 45. But for example, if you, if your flow is in between 45 and near 100 kilogram cubic meter, probably your flow is not going, your hyperpignal flow will be very low concentration and will be light. So this flow is going to be hyperpignal but can interact with waves forming different kind of hyperpignal flow deposit hyperpignal deltas. So this is a light hyperpignal flow. In contrast, if your sediment supply in your basin is higher than 100 kilograms cubic meter or big or can be 200 or more, this hyperpignal flow will be much more heavy and also you can have erosion on the bottom and your deposit will be very different with channels and lobes. Channels in proximal position and lobes. So these are two different kind of deltas. This hyperpignal littoral deltas and this one is hyperpignal subaqueous delta. So the different, the main different is in the density of the incoming flow. If the density is higher, so this flow will reach much more heavy and can be attached to the bottom and can accumulate channels and lobes. And if this hyperpignal flow is, the density is lower, the flow will be a hyperpignal, but we are going to have this beautiful interaction with waves, sometimes forming this quarsening upward parasequences, wave dominated deposits, forming this kind of deltas, ramp deltas, extended for sometimes hundreds of kilometers basin work, forming these quarsening and thickening upward sequences in which we have interaction of uh, hyperpignal flows and waves or tides. So now we can go back into this classification and we are going to try to see how this different uh, contrast in the flow density affect the kind of deltas and the shape of the typical deltas. For example, all these are literal deltas associated to the hypopignal field. Then you have the homopignal field and finally we go into the hyperpignal field. This is the hyperpignal littoral delta with this ramp, with this uh, light hyperpignal flow, and this is the more high density hyperpignal flows that can create this more, this subaqueous deltas. So let's see 
uh, now a picture in which we can see all the kind of deltas we have in this classification. Of course, hyperpignal fan deltas need always some slope because we need here inertia dominated flows that create these lobes. So this is a typical situation happen in areas in which we have high relief. Then we have the marine littoral deltas. You know these marine littoral deltas are the typical deltas you have in uh, the, for example, the classification of Galloway. Fluvial dominated, way dominated, and tide dominated deltas. Deltas which are literal, coastal deltas, and in which the delta from deposits interacts with the uh, with waves and tides. One typical characteristic of these littoral deltas or marine littoral deltas is the building of this quarsening upward succession in which we go from pro delta deposits delta from deposits more sandy and finally delta plain with channels and soils also with can be also some coal level okay this is the typical quarsening and thickening upward sequence in marine littoral delta. This is because in these deltas you have the according to the progradation of the deltas you have delta front pro delta and delta plane. So this is delta plane, delta front, and this is pro delta. You go here, you have pro delta, delta front, and on top delta plane. Here another succession starting with pro delta. So, if you make here a vertical section, you will find, I don't know if I can use the green, I can use the green, no? Okay, I will use this brown. It's okay, this is delta plane. In delta plane you have this coal level sometimes. So you make here this one, this section is a vertical succession you can find in here. In which you start from pro delta, delta from, and you go into delta plane. The main difference with the in between these marine littoral deltas and hyperpignal littoral deltas is that these deltas you are never have on top the delta plane. So this is the case of marine littoral deltas in which you have pro delta, delta from and delta plane. Mm? Delta plane. In hyperpignal littoral deltas you commonly have shales 
then wave dominated deposit shale wave dominated deposit shale and sometimes you can end here with some limestone in some situation you can end this progradational with a limestone but you never have here the delta plane so in hyperpignal literal because this is the, the reason why is we are very far from the coast so you have this kind of progradational system but the coast is very far so these deltas can extend more than 100 kilometers from the coast so if you see in a vertical succession you will see several quarsening upward cycles in here you have reworking by waves together with interaction with hyperpignal flows so these hyperpignal flows interact with waves providing sediment in suspension that are commonly re-elaborated by the waves so making this kind of ramps so in hyperpignal littoral deltas the, no we don't have delta plane on top just in some cases you can have limestones so the shape and the stacking is similar to marine littoral delta but in contrast in contrast in marine littoral delta we have delta plane in hyperpignal littoral deltas we don't have delta plane on top so uh, going down to this uh, diagram you have here marine littoral deltas hyperpignal littoral deltas much more extended respect to the coast and make possible to grow at the shelf and finally if the hyperpignal flow becomes more heavy you can have this shelf and sandstone love shelf and sandstone love of muti professor muti described very well in the paper of 1996 and uh, also you can these flows can reach the deeper part of the basin and can accumulate basin floor fans related to extravasional turbidite all these elements in the present paper are considered part of deltas or these are different expression of the delta not just the marine littoral deltas as we commonly found in papers and in books it's very important for understanding our depositional system to put a real scale of delta sedimentation so now we can see some field examples of different kind of deltas so first of all i would like to start with a marine example of marine littoral deltas as we see as we discussed previously in marine littoral deltas one characteristic feature is because we are very close to the um, to the land at the top of the progradational part of the delta <coughs> we have subaerial processes suggesting that these are really coastal deltas so let's see now an example of this marine littoral deltas from the Neuken Basin.
for that we are going to move into the Neuken Basin in the southern part of the Neuken Basin we had to go to the globe here the southern part and from here we are going to move to the right here to the other side the right Bosque Petrificado area and uh, here we are going to see a beautiful example of littoral delta, very coarse grain littoral deltas. This is the location two here. We are going to land here and we can see here a, bird is a succession with this vertical I will make a sketch of the the outcrop we start this outcrop with marine deposits with some turbidites here some channels and after some point you have to have you start to have conglomerates here these conglomerates becomes vertical the on the upper part of this conglomerate we start to have some waste and evidence of subaerial bed lot by by uh, fluid gravity flows bed load deposit by fluid gravity flow so suggesting that we are in subaerial environment on top of this succession we have the another unit lotena formation different angular unconformities and on top red beds of Neuken group so in the lower part you have the Jurassic this is the shales of the Los Moges formation this is Los Moges formation Jurassic then you have this progradational this progradation going into Lajas formation and at the end a sequence boundary here an angular unconformity and you have Lotena formation or bosque petrificado formation is equivalent then you have here vaca muerta formation and finally the Neuken group on top the Cretaceous hmm? okay, okay this is the Los Moses formation then you have the conglomerate of Lajas formation then this Lotena or Bosque Petrificado formation here Vaca Muerta and the Neuken group on top so this is the red bed on the Neuken group shales of Vaca Muerta formation red beds from Lotena formation and this is these are the conglomerates of Lajas formation with this sun wage these are sun sun wage and I, I'm going to explain a little a bit a little bit what means probably we have here a system 
with a steep quartz grain delta with conglomerates that goes into pro delta setting here all this composed of gravels and conglomerate also with some channels that bypass here with some gravels in the delta from bypass the delta from and on top you have a braided fluvial system with this kind of bars so all this system is part of a progradational quartz grain littoral delta Oh, this are the, these are the conglomerates that go in the deeper part into shale these conglomerates that bypass the delta front and here you have braided fluvial system why we know okay this is delta front and this is pro delta pro delta this pro delta is equivalent to the Los Moges formation and all this, this is one pro delta and then this is two delta front Lajas formation and then we go into three which is the delta plane. Of course in these bars we have bars here in this fluvial system related to flat periods and at the end of, sand, of flat periods you have this sandstone wedge in between this conglomerate. This sandstone wedge is a typical feature of braided rivers. So you have these gravels here forming this longitudinal bars and these are sand weights. So sand weights pinch out, typical pinching out sandstone and this sandwich and longitudinal bars are typical of this part of the basin. Also, you, here you have fluid gravity flows. You can recognize fluid gravity flows by the presence of gravels without matrix. So this is a class supported gravels with no matrix means that bed lot which was just was a bed lot without suspended load so you don't have matrix here just gravels this is a typical feature that suggests fluid gravity flow so in the vertical succession here we go from pro delta delta from and some kind of delta plane or something like that. Uh, so let's go to the field now. 
and just follow the localities you have in the okay from this point you can see this is this 3d okay you go from the pro delta here pro delta here delta front and delta plane on top you can see here in this 3d model beautiful 3d model you can see all the succession that crop out here and uh, you can navigate and see the transition from this is a pro delta deposit this is in a vertical succession here just keep here okay in a vertical succession you go here from pro delta you go to delta front and on top delta plane mm. so all this is a progradational feature that marks this kind of delta you have here this is the progradational the kind of progradation you can see in the outcrop so going back into the outcrop we can go to see the pro delta deposits <coughs> okay from this point you can see uh, the shales of the pro delta and the base of the delta front and if we land here we can see some beautiful examples this here this you can zoom in here a little bit okay you can see this very impressive cross cutting channels here these channels located in the lower delta front are basically this kind of channels that escape from the delta front probably with hyperpignal flows and okay this yeah this is a, a photograph of this of this channel on top oh, th this is another example of the channel uh, you can see some gravels with interaction of bed lot and suspended lot oh you can we, we had to make the break <laughs> we forgot uh, hmm? okay we are going to end this locality okay and the lower delta front very typically you can have this very beautiful trees this is a, in, a, a tree you can see the photograph here okay this is a fossilized tree uh, in the lower delta front okay okay if we go upward to see delta front deposits okay this is just another photograph go back to the next okay from this position it's possible to see this some uh, sandwich this uh, sandwich are this typical kind of deposit that suggest subaerial condition between the different longitudinal bars mm. and uh, in the next uh, uh, point here you have another beautiful sandwich here okay this this one is typical sandwich like the one I draw here and also in the, the another photograph you can see evidence of reworking by uh, yes, close same no, it's another this one reworking by water uh, sediment free water flows as you can see here the gravels these gravels don't have any sandy matrix 
means that this is a kind of bed lot you have a bed lot without suspended lot the typical typical situation in a fluid gravity flow fluid gravity flow that carries water and at the bottom transport gravels so you don't have here suspended sediment so it's just water and bed lot like in a river in a normal river so this is just water and on the bottom you have bed lot so the final deposit you have this class with no matrix so no matrix means no suspended load so this is only possible in subaerial environment mm? because it's sediment free water so you cannot find here sandstone just gravels this is a typical feature of the upper part of the delta mm? this situation that happened here with this bed lot deposit with no matrix so okay we are going to continue now showing some examples of uh, homopignal deltas you know homopignal deltas form exclusively on lakes on shallow uh, freshwater lakes so for this we are going to move to another basin just to remember in homopignal flow the density is the same so the density of the fluvial discharge is the same density that the water in the reservoir so the entire plume collapse here mm, and typically form this high gradient delta front you can have this uh, quartz grain deltas we call Gilbert deltas or we can have another kind of homopignal uh, deltas sandy homopignal deltas which are more low gradient but you clearly can see this delta front the typical feature if you can if you can trace delta from up to the lower part changing the thickness of this bed so for this we are going to move into another basin in Argentina the Cuyo Basin to see some examples from Rio Blanco formation so okay just this is the upper part of the sedimentation in the Cuyo Basin. We are going to move into the area. <coughs> okay, in the Potrerillos area, we're going to land there in the upper part of the section in which this lake changed 
from uh, underfield to overfield condition. In this succession, over a, a basement, you have deposits of conglomerates making several finding upward cycles. All these lower parts belong to an uh, underfield lake. This is a Triassic lake. And on top of the underfield lake we have shales, black shales, this is the source rock of this is Cacheuta formation, very famous in Argentina. You go, for example, this is oil shales. These are also lacustrine beds with some sandstone and shale on top. All this part is underfield lake. And some place you have the break of spill point break. And then you go into different kind of delta. So you have this red bed shales and deltas here. These deltas are associated to the overfill condition. You go so from underfill to overfill lake. In this transition you see a change in the color. This related you go this lower part of the lake is brackish the upper part of the lake over this uh, spill pond break is fresh water. At the boundary here you have very beautiful homopignal littoral deltas. We are going to see some examples of these homopignal littoral deltas here. This is known as Rio Blanco formation. All this is Triassic in time. So let's go to the outcrop and of course this is the lower part of the succession. You have this the underfill part of the lake this part and on top you have the black shale of the Cacheuta formation. We are in a marginal position in the deeper part of the lake Cacheuta formation is much more thicker and at this point you have the change in color. This is because of the spill point break and you go from underfill condition into overfill condition. So in this freshwater lake you have these red shales here and on top you have very beautiful deltas. We are going to see these deltas here in detail. Uh, for that we are going to move to the next uh, position. <coughs> no. Cacheto uno, gira. ¿Y qué es el número dice ahí? Ahí está, es. Ok. Alejate un poquito. Ok. En this point, you can rotate and you will see the position. Rota un poquito más, para acá. 
okay this is the shales on in below the red beds and on top you have these beautiful deltas you can unzoom a little okay just enter here <coughs> okay you can unzoom okay you have on top you have some people here for scale here mm. and you can see here two progradational succession of deltas first one mm going from pro delta to delta front and second one here going also from pro delta to delta front and here some channels distributary channels on top of the but a very interesting you can trace you can go down here from pro delta is from pro delta from delta from to pro delta areas so you can trace laterally if you move you rotate here you can see the deep the different you can zoom in here okay you can see how the delta from goes down here typically of this high gradient uh, homopignal deltas okay let's go back to the presentation uh, now we are going to see some uh, uh, beautiful examples of these ramp deltas or hyperpignal literal deltas this kind of hyperpignal literal deltas are originated with this uh, flows hyperpignal flows when which uh, don't have don't don't are very heavy so heavy hyperpignal flows usually form subaqueous hyperpignal subaqueous deltas or hyperpignal fan deltas but if your hyperpignal flow is not really heavy the flow will plunge and can interact with waves and with tide so the deposit will be absolutely different so uh, if we uh, we see the deposit of this uh, hyperpignal flows this light hyperpignal flows you can see this set of parasequences with different quarsening upward intervals that can be for example wave dominated in a vertical succession typically uh, many of these deposits were described as short phase parasequence in many papers but basically this is a lower delta front or lower short phase and then you have upper delta front of upper short phase and in some situation you can find a limestone on top this limestone represent times in which the supply of sediment into the basin stops so the subsidence return the basin into again into a more deep uh, deeper position so this is in this cartoon also this is another paper that was published in a journal of paleogeography paper by Irastorza et al you can find in the journal of paleogeography and in this paper we provide a description of uh, this kind an analysis of this kind of hyperpignal littoral deltas 
these kind of ramps in which you have a progradation first and then when the flow the supply of sediment stop you have this limestone that can be traced for long distance that mark a uh, decrease in sediment supply and probably an increase in salinity into more normal condition typically during these periods in which we have a lot of supply of fresh water some continental or inner continental or um, ba marine basin can become more brackish so you can have changes in salinity also okay let's go to the field and to see some examples of these hyperpignal littoral deltas for this we are going to fly back into the Neuken Basin and uh, going back into the globe <coughs> to the central part of the basin no, go back, uh, yeah central part and then from here to the Bajada del Agrio area okay uh, Bajada del Agrio is, a, is an area with beautiful example of the lower Cretaceous you have a series of anticlines here uh, with beautiful exposure of uh, this kind of deposit. We are going to land here in the number five and uh, from this uh, drone view you can see the large extension of this kind of deltas. Every progradational system you see here this, all these are hyperpignal littoral deltas. You can trace these hyperpignal littoral deltas for hundreds of kilometers. Uh, you have another view in the, the second, Bajada del Agrio A, is uh, much more beautiful from here because you can see more regionally how is the extension of hyperpignal littoral deltas. These deltas is not easy to trace the delta uh, forsets because they can be traced for many kilometers you can see on the distance also on the right the outcrops are excellent so now we are going to learn to see in more detail the characteristic of these deltas <coughs> okay we are close to the surface now and from here we are going to go closer okay in this position we are in the lower part of a progradational succession we go to the next point and uh, we see the distal part of this progradational uh, littoral if you click here in the 3D model I will go into the drawing board again okay you have here different progradational sequences the lower part the lower one you can see here in the bottom okay here you have shales and on top you have limestone then you have shales and on top you have some sandstone with weight reworking and limestone then shales sandstone with weight reworking increasing content of waves action and finally limestone so if we make uh, drawing of this succession you will see at the beginning shales with limestone on top then shales with some way bedding
and limestone level with a lot of shells on top and finally wavy bedding lenticular bedding hamoki cross stratification lot of wave action and on top of this bed you have again the limestone so you have here one two three progradational succession this is the the one you can see here this is the first one is here I will write in here okay this is one this is two and this is three so in a vertical succession you have one prograding here the second prograding here and the third progradational here all this is prograding and uh, every one ev every one of these uh, progradational system at top you have these limestones levels so if we go back into the drawing this is the limestone on top and you have shale here shale with some sandstones and here the succession is much more sandy so this is the typical progradation of a system in which you have several ramps every ramp on top of every ramp you have this limestone interval So, when you see the vertical progradation, of course, on top of every progradational system, you don't have the delta plane, because the delta plane of these deltas was very, very far. So, in a vertical succession, you will see this progradational stacking pattern so you go from pro delta lower delta from and upper delta from this succession you have here with this progradational pattern is the same succession you can find for example here this is progradational pattern of different sequences different hyperpignal littoral deltas so let's go to the field and see some examples we can close and we can see for example here some in the photograph you can see the limestones with a lot of uh, fossils here in the sand at the top of sandstone you also have olites from the reworking by waves and in the upper part of the in the last stop here you have beautiful examples of wave reworking deposits this is the wave action that acts together with the hyperpignal with the 
low density hyperpigmented flow. You have some hamoki cross certification, erosion, and a lot of plant remains. These plant remains are very important because suggest that we are in a delta, in a delta system. So this is not typical deltas. Uh, we also have a lot of surfaces with the uh, wave action and in some situations, okay, this is the limestone on top and uh, in some situation you have also some starfish. I don't know if this in this one or another photograph. Okay, the next, this, that one. Okay, here you can have, you can see a beautiful way of working. Okay, this is a starfish on top of the, on the sandstone. Okay, uh, let's go now to see another example of hyperpigmented littoral deltas. Hmm? Sí. No, le, le, we are going fast to see in the north uh, Minas San Eduardo, another example. Okay. No, no Chumalal. No, Minas, the last one, this one. Okay. Okay, this is another beautiful sections, your beautiful outcrops. Uh, you have a very big anticline and at the core of the anticline, this, sec this point one, we are going to land there to see it in a different unit. This is the Mulichinko formation and uh, no more there. You can open the topper, the top here and to choose the locality. Okay just to see some to this position okay no that one okay a uh, beautiful progradational section also of ram deltas going upward and ending with uh, a limestone also very extended a lot of wave reworking together with this uh, fine grainy sandstone associated to hyperpignal flows, wave reworking deposits. Is when we go now to the next uh, stop, this is the San Eduardo II, this one. Here also another progradational sequence here, you go from this pro delta to lower delta front and then on top you have a limestone this is a progradational section and in the interaction in between hyperpignal flows and waves you have this beautiful uh, hamoki cross stratification Okay, you can rotate, you can see better how this convex upward levels appear. This is a typical small scale hamoki cross stratification associated to these hyperpignal littoral deltas. Okay, let's go back into the presentation now. <coughs> Okay, now we are going to see the in the last part of this presentation hyperpignal subaqueous deltas. Hyperpignal subaqueous deltas are some kind of extravational turbidite and can accumulate the sediment in the shelf or also in deep water. So very interesting for the filling of our outcrops. We are going to see a beautiful example in the Arroyo Cobunco area. For that, we are going to move to the central part of the basin.
So, we are going to land. Tenía que cambiar la cámara. Okay. We are going to land here. El primero, como este, primero el de abajo. Eso. Okay. Just to see here uh shales from offshore deposits and on top you have these lobes very interesting this lobe with sandstones and gravels you can we can see some of this uh, 3d model is very interesting because though this kind of beds here In below you have a lot of uh, lofting deposit related to the flow density reversal and on top you can see this conglomerate that start with sandstone then you have gravels and end with sandstone. You can open the, the other. Okay, this one. Okay, this is a beautiful example of a bed in which you can see that this is the basal boundary of the flow. The flow power increase. This is the peak of the flow, the maximum power of the flow, and then the flow wanes. So you have in a fluvial discharge in a fluvial discharge during time you increase the power of the fluvial discharge this is the maximum power and then the flow this decrease so this is the flow peak the maximum energy of the flow so you hope you have the uh walks in part of the flow in wind in which the, the the energy is increasing and then you have the waning part of the flow in which the energy is decreasing if you see in this deposit you will see here that you have sandstone gravels here bed lot dominated deposits and on top sandstone massive sandstones or laminated sandstone again so this is waxing part of the flow this is the peak of the hyperpignal discharge and then we have the waning part of the flow of course This is like the waxing, waning, hyperpignite of uh, Mulder, but in other scale. So you have an increasing energy here and decreasing energy in the upper during the upper part. So going to the outcrop, this part is the waxing part. This area is the peak of the flow and on the upper part we have the warning part so the flow discharge is increasing the flow power and then is decreasing so during all this during a single hyperpignal flow so let's move into the next uh, the other position here okay and uh, from here you can see another more beautiful example this one
This is another example and we can clearly see here how the most uh, quartz grainy material is not at the base. So the grain size is increasing here from sandstone here to gravel and then on the top is again in decreasing into sandstone. So we have then increase and decrease. This part is the peak of the flow, of a hyperpignal flow. It's a bed lot dominated hyperpignal flow in a subaqueous delta. So we don't have too much time. We had to move to another outcrop, very close to here. The same in the Sierra La Vaca Muerta, Los Catutos. Okay. Okay, this is a um, uh, very beautiful succession in which uh, you have uh, here an anticline and collapse. This is uh, basically it was an anticline and then this anticline collapse here and create here some confined delta deposits, confined subaqueous delta deposit, hyperpignal subaqueous delta. So this is the lower unit. This is Lajas formation. And on top of Lajas formation, you have this confined and unconfined. This is confined and this is unconfined hyperpignal subaqueous deltas. So we are going to see example of both type. First you are going to see confined hyperpignal subaqueous delta constrained with this topography associated to this Jurassic anticline that collapsed here this is the confined part of the flow and on top you have the unconfined part. So let's see this uh, 3D model here. In the 3D model is much more easy to see how is the unzoom. Okay. This is very thick. These are very thick hyperpignal subaqueous deltas, may, ma mostly made of massive sandstones. The thickness is related to the confinement of these, these uh, flows. So we are going to land now in the next uh, stop. Okay, you have to close this and move using the... Okay. This, all these are very thick sandstones intervals here with uh, some concretions. This has, these are carbonate concretion cementing the sandstones. This is all this is sandstone, but in this case you have carbonate cement. This is a particular uh, weathering surfaces forming this onion weathering. And uh, you can see several 3D model. In below you have, perhaps you have one 3D model? No, on top. Okay, a 3D model where we can see these <coughs> massive sandstones, very beautiful massive sandstones related to these uh, subaqueous deltas. Mm, we can close, we can go the next, I don't know, is C5. Okay, in this uh, outcrop, you can have, oh you have also a sample here.
of this uh, massive sandstone related to the Subecus Delta. You can see that the sandstone is well sorted and is absolutely massive. This is because of the high rate of sediment fallout. <coughs> and also we can see some more 3D models. Okay. On top we have this uh, limestone level. Okay, closed. Uh, let's go to the next uh, stop here just to see the unconfined deposits. You can open one of these 3D models. Here you don't have the confinement, so these lobes related to the hyperpignal subacos delta are much more continuous and the thickness decrease. So this looks like a turbidite. These, in fact, are shellfall turbidite or shellfall sandton lobes, as was described by Professor Muti many years ago. Uh, okay, you have the next one, this one. It's a, it's a, it's a three, just to see another example. And then we are going to move into deep water. Okay, beautiful example of these massive sandstones without ripples on top. This is like a TA of Boma, but without ripples. Typical deposit of subequos, hyperpignal subequos deltas. <coughs> okay, I think we can move into deeper water. For this, we are going to fly to the southern part of the basin and to see in the railway section, in the southern part, the Rio Belisle outcrop. Mm, this railway. Mm? Y lo tenés, al revés. O si no, andate acá, directamente es el 4. No, turboglifo, no, me equivoqué. <risa> RB, esto es RB, RB1. Mm -mm. Ok, now we are in deep water deposit from the Los Molles formation. Uh, typical deep water deltas and uh, we can see in the photograph some details of this kind of deposits sometimes with a lot of clay clast transported as bed lot mm, massive sandstones you can open the other photograph on this side. Okay, this class that are floating here are part of the interaction between suspended load and bed load in this uh, hyperpignal subaqueous deltas. You have imbricated clay class floating in massive sandstone, well sorted sandstone, and you here can see clearly the class imbrication in this suggesting a flow going this way. <coughs> okay. ¿Cuál estaba marcado ahí? No, estaban los RB. <coughs> okay. They see some one more here bed load dominated 
Hmm. Okay. Andar primero. RB1. RB2. Okay. Here is a 3D model of the entire outcrop. These are very large, probably waterscape or deposits disturbed by some sliding. Mm. This one is very big deformation features you have here. Entre el RB2. This one. Okay, I would like to show you here some how these beds looks like. Next one. This typical deposits of subacos, hyperpignal subacos delta, you have massive sandstones and on top lofting deposit. So this is lofting and this is massive or a TA, Boma TA. So you don't have here ripples, for example, because this is a feature that happened when the flow start to buoy before achieving the velocity of forming ripples. So this situation happened when you have a hyperpignal flow here with a lot of sediment in suspension and you are accumulating massive sandstones and before getting the velocity of forming ripples the flow start to buoy so it's no chances to make ripples in this context you have just massive sandstones on the bottom and then on top of this sandstone you have the fallout of plant remains forming this lofting with a lot of plant remain. If you, the next photograph, you will see the lofting, typical lofting deposits, this one, with a lot of plant remains along the surface. This is part of the Boyan plume. This is another beautiful example in which you have this massive sandstone here and on top this interval is lofting deposit so you don't have any ripples here in the boundary just massive and lofting okay let's go into china now to see our last uh, outcrop we are going to move into Ordos Basin. In Ordos Basin, we are going to visit some beautiful example of Chang Ten. You know the Ordos Basin? This one. Yes. You know the Ordos Basin? It was uh, the Yan Chang formation was a very big lake so uh, you are going to land first in this one was a very big lake and at the beginning was an underfill lake so in an underfill lake you know that the lake level fluctuates hardly fluctuates because in between uh, spill point so you have minimum lake level and maximum lake level so lake level change here during the the variation so if you increase your sediment supply by rivers the lake level is going to rise 
and after that when the lake level don't receive too much water the lake level is going to fall so this is the spill point that limited the level of the lake so the lake is fluctuating continuously and typically if you start incorporating water you start here with fluvial deposits at the bottom then you go into lacustrine, lacustrine lobes as the lake level rise and at the end when the lake level fall at this time you have soils so this is the typical situation in Ordos Basin you have a transgressive system track here the lake level is rising and at the end you have a regressive system track because the lake level is falling so we are going to see some beautiful example of these deltas these are deltas but in contrast to the kind of deltas you have in marine setting or in overfill lakes in these deltas are these deltas are finding upward deltas not quarsening upward deltas so let's see some examples at the bottom you have here some soils you can open some of these 3d models <coughs> beautiful soils with caliche nodules here suggesting subaerial condition and on top of these soils you see you can close this on top of these soils you can see the initial transgression going into the basal fluvial succession so you go from these soils here you have this fluvial part then you have in the upper part the lobes so uh, you go you can you go back into the first one this just to see the 3d no era este cuál era el primero que estaba marcado ahí jc pero no tiene el modelo 3D el, ma el, ma el mapeo okay. just wait a moment <coughs> ok Or just a moment ok, this one just click here just to show you how the stacking of this system is you have paleosoils on the bottom then you have the fluvial deposits transgressive system track you go into lobes here and finally you end with paleosols so this is fluvial interval then lobes and on top you have paleosols again so fluvial loves and all this is transgression lake transgression and at the end you have the lake level fall falling again okay just closed we can go to the next uh, stop okay hay uno general que es el y no está puesto no, no this, the another, no e. Volve acá, más adelante. Es la otra localidad. No, no, es más adelante, es otra localidad. Fíjate que está ahí puesto en la hoja, no es i. Uh -huh, movete. Ok. This is another another locality, more basin water, just to see the upper part 
of the paleo soils we have probably we have a 3d model here okay this you have yeah you can both you have open both okay this is a 3d model of the outcrop you have uh, here the paleosols of the top of the last sequence then you have another transgressive sequence with uh, s lake level fall on top and then again and finally these are beautiful also fluvial channels at the base of the next sequence you can close this and open this one in which you have a line drawing showing the different transgressive system track and regressive system track this is the fluvial channel we saw in the last picture just close this and we go we can go into x5 uh, just to see some uh, examples <coughs> you can open here to see some paleosols with roots with a lot of roots that uh, professor lee from petro china showed me beautiful roots and on top you have the flooding of this black shale and also in the next uh, x7 <coughs> in this uh, paleosols you have here very beautiful you can open one of these calamites this was excellent example of trees growing on top of this uh, you can open the next the other 3d is also beautiful this one no this is more beautiful because you can clearly see the different the characteristic of these calamites according to this to the interpretation you have a soil here hmm, with this calamite tree here and when the river came the river flood is costing you have the 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 tree you have the calamites here and the calamites became preserved inside massive sandstone is the typical situation very common in ordos ordos is amazing also in the preservation of these very beautiful trees so I think we can go into some conclusion. Okay, some conclusions. Uh, we have different kind of deltas. We have uh, marine littoral deltas. This one, our point source. Uh, usually, you have this shift in deltas and mostly those these, these deltas are related to fluid gravity flows then we have hyperpignal littoral deltas that form this kind of ram deltas and are produced by dirty rivers Divers, river tiles supply mixture of water and sediment that interact with waves and tides so this is not heavy loaded hyperpignal flows uh, for heavy loaded hyperpignal flows, we have hyperpignal subaqueous deltas. And hyperpignal subaqueous delta, or this extravational turbidite, can accumulate on the shelf and also on deep water, forming this extravational turbidite. All these elements are part of the deltas. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we are a small <laughs> company also we make all this research 
also for collaboration from the industry and also from the different research programs. So uh, it was a pleasure for us to share all these ideas with you. It will be our pleasure to discuss all these ideas in the future. I invite you to visit the web page of the Journal of Paleogeography and also to join the International Society of Paleogeography, which is growing very fast. Uh, our company also provides services for oil industry and uh, also we can make a virtual environment for different kind of situation, for basins, for outcrops. Our idea is in the future to make an international library for outcrops, including outcrops or different parts of the world, to make field geology more accessible for everyone. So, Thank you very much. I don't want to get more time for you. We are open for questions. Also, you can write your question in the chat and we can take some, much, some time to answer your, your concern.